This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome to On the Market. I am your host, Dave Meyer, joined by the full gang today. We got James, Henry, Jamil, and Kathy. I'm excited to have you all here because I have two pretty cool announcements for you. I think you all know, you might know this, but today, this episode, we're recording it beforehand, but is going to be our one year anniversary episode. Woohoo! So, congratulations, everyone. We made it through a full year of On the Market. As a magazine. Happy anniversary. Yeah. Well, it's pretty exciting. I think we've got 80 something shows, 90 something shows at this point. And so, um, all of them have been a real pleasure to do with all of you and with the guests. So, thank you all for being here. And coincidentally, and the same exact week, we have something else exciting. James, I'm going to need you to call your jeweler because if you don't know, James bought us these these <laughs> necklaces to celebrate a, a million downloads, but we just got to two million downloads already. What? Oh, yeah. That's crazy. Just a couple of weeks ago, and now we're at two million downloads just in time for our birthday. So oh. I just wanted to say congratulations to all of you. And thank you, all of you listeners, all, you know, I don't even know how many of you are out there, but every <laughs> single one of you, we appreciate you listening to this show. Um, it's been a real pleasure and so much fun and truly a dream come true to make this show. And, and we really appreciate it. So happy to be a part of it. That's amazing. Love you guys. <laughs> all right, Jamil, you got to get us all Bentleys. <laughs> <laughs> I did the chains. You're up next. <laughs> Done. That escalated quickly and I like it. <laughs> All right. Well, we do have a great show for you today. We're going to be bringing on two listeners to talk about deals that they're working through. And if you listen to our show a week or two ago, we did this with residential uh, real estate. And now we're going to do a commercial show. When we put out a call to listeners about deals that they're doing, we got so many, we had to split it up and we picked two residential, did that a few weeks ago. Now we're going to do two commercial deals, and and they're phenomenal. It's really exciting conversation. But before we jump into that, I want to throw it to Henry, who has an update for us already about the one of the deals that we heard about a few weeks ago on our residential show. Yeah, absolutely. So we had one of my students, Matt McMains, on the show last time pitching a deal that he had gotten under contract. And I think a lot of the feedback that he got was that there just wasn't quite enough room and that even though he was beyond his inspection period, I think Jamil gave him the advice to say, hey, why don't you go and you have a sit down, take a look at the current market conditions. Things are different than they were when you first put this under contract and try to renegotiate some room in the deal so that you could potentially get a profit. And so he took that advice. He went to the seller. And even though he was beyond his period, he told them that he's evaluated the deal and he just needs a little more room. And because the seller understood that and was in a position that they had room to come down and he was able to negotiate another 15,000 off of that price. And so now he is in a safe space with that deal and he's going to make some money. You know, he was in a position before where he might have had to let go of the deal and uh, give up his uh, non-refundable and his money. And now he is going to do the exact opposite, stay in it and make money all because what we're doing on this show is working. So it's 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 a great advertisement to say, hey, if you if you get the shot and you hear the call, send your deals. We're here to help. Love it. Wow. That's awesome. That's super exciting. That that makes my day for sure. So cool. All right. So we're going to get into today's episode, which is commercial in nature. But even if you're not a commercial investor or interested in commercial deals at this point, we still learn a lot. Um, all the conversation that we have is really applicable to really almost any type of real estate. There are two terms that we throw out during this uh, during this episode that I just want to make sure people are aware of. The first one is NOI, stands for Net Operating Income. It is similar to cash flow, except it doesn't include debt service or capital expenditures. And so it gives you just basically a good idea of how much income you have. If you weren't to have a loan on it and you didn't, you know, account for any big expenses, capital expenditures like a roof or HVAC system or something like that. So that's NOI. The second one is cap rate. 
which is sort of this complex and often confused thing in real estate. But basically what it is is a measure of market sentiment. So when a cap rate is low, like around 3%, which is an example in this deal, that means that the price of the property is super high um, and it, it's very expensive for the buyer and really good for the seller. When the cap rate is higher, that is generally good for the buyer and not as good for the seller. I'm not going to get into the math or the details of that. If you do want to learn more about that, you can check out my book, Real Estate by the Numbers. I go to that in detail as James is very kindly holding up for me because he reminded me to pitch my book. Thank you. Um, okay, someone did. Um, and so you could check that out. But for the, that's all you really need to know for the context of this episode, that when cap rates are lower, good for the seller, not as good for the buyer. When cap rates move up, that is good for the buyer and not as good for the seller. Cap rate, no one sets them. They are dictated by market conditions and they fluctuate based on macroeconomic conditions, buyer demand, lending standards, all sorts of different things. Um, but I think that's enough to for you to understand what's going on in this episode. So we are going to take a quick break and then we will get into our two listener deals uh, who are working on commercial deals right now. Ben Mashat, welcome to On The Market. Thanks for joining us. How's it going? It's great to be here. Great to have you. Before we get into your deal, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your involvement so far in the real estate industry? Yeah, sounds good. So I think back in 2019, I was going to college for mechanical engineering, and then I decided to drop out because I, I just didn't enjoy doing it. I didn't like doing the homework. I said, there's no way I could do this for the rest of my life. So i uh, Ended up dropping out. Um, I think a year later, I got a job doing um, rain gutters, making a hundred bucks an hour, making killer money. And uh, again, I was like, I hate doing this. I, there's no way I could do this. So my best friend and now business partner showed me Jamil and Astro Flipping, and we ended up joining the community. It was the best decision we've ever made in our life. And that kind of brings us to today. So quit my job about four months ago, and now we are full-time in real estate and we're loving it. Well, congratulations that you found something that you're you're passionate about. It's not an yeah. not an easy thing to do, and uh, it sounds like you you lined yourself up with a great community there, which is awesome. So let's get into the deal. What uh what deal are you bringing us today? So this deal, um, I've been doing single family wholesaling, single family, and it's been going great. Um, we've been getting a lot of opportunities, um, and then this deal kind of got thrown on my lap by another wholesaler. So it's a commercial deal in West Palm Beach, Florida. It's right in Riviera Beach. It is a huge $13 million commercial building. And when it first got sent to me, I didn't know what to do with it. I was like, I, you know, I have a buyer for this. I don't really know how to underwrite it. It's commercial, so it's not multifamily. I wasn't sure if you underwrote it the same way. So I got the P&Ls, I got the rent roll, I got the occupancy, how much money it makes. I could find the cap rate, but I didn't know if it was a deal. I didn't know if it was only cap rate um, or, you know, if there's more, if there's more to it. So um, right now, this deal is at 50% occupancy. It's a 45,000 square foot building on almost two acres right on the beach. So the yearly taxes is $110,000. It was just recently renovated, so it doesn't really need, there's not much value add. The gross revenue, so it makes around a million dollars a year. The total operating expenses are $500,000 a year. And then the NOI is right around $450,000 a year. So it cash flows about $400,000 a year, but it's got a huge purchase price. So I wasn't sure how to underwrite it. And the, the NOI operating, all the stuff you just said, that's at 50% occupancy? So that is pro forma. So that is at 90% occupancy, it will make that much. Okay. That's the projected. And can you tell us a little bit about the location before we open it up to everyone? We'd just love to just know a little bit about the location and just tell us like why you like the deal. So it is, it's a beautiful building and it's a huge building that can make a lot of money to an investor if someone decides to buy it, but it's got to be at that 90% occupancy rate. So if we can get that building filled up, it will cash flow $400,000 a year. And I was like, I was looking at it. I was like, holy crap, like this definitely looks like an opportunity. If somebody knows how to market it out and get that building filled up to good renters, there could be huge opportunity here. So 
I have all these projected numbers, right? But that doesn't really tell me what it's making right now. And that doesn't tell me even if it is a deal because $13 million, that's a, that's a big purchase price. I think I was running cap rate and that's the, with the pro forma numbers, I ran the cap rate and it was at like a four, four percent cap rate. And I know most investors are wanting like eight or nine, maybe 12. Am I wrong or I'm getting cap rate at 3%. Did I do something wrong? Yeah, I'm getting, I'm getting three as well. I got under three. Yeah. 2.9. And, and that's not, um, that's not including, I mean, we're not talking about any debt service in, in that right. equation, right? Okay. So it's really not cash flowing at all once you include <laughs> debt service. This is what they call rich guy property. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's all on the beach and it doesn't cash flow. So James property? <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> no, definitely not. That's a different type of property. <laughs> it's, I mean, talk about location though. Sorry if I missed this. What is it office or retail or what, what kind of? Office space. And then how long has that 50% not been vacant? Or And do you know, was that one tenant or was it a few tenants? And, and do you know how long they've been up for lease for? And, and then also how much are they up for lease for per square foot? So base rent per square foot on the first level, it's $10. On the second level, it's like $34. Down here, it says 500. I'm not sure if that's correct, but there is a lot of suites in the building. It's a, it's a five story, 45,000 square foot building. So that's why it might, that's why I don't think it's filled up. It's just a huge building and maybe they haven't been marketing it out correctly. I assume those suites are configurable as well, right? So it could be yeah, a number of tenants and how long, or do you have the leases of the current tenant? Like how long are they in place and are they paying market rents? I believe they're paying market rents and some of the tenants are there for the next three years. I think one's there for the next five years. Um, they're all long-term, they're all long-term tenants. I mean, office is getting hammered right now. And I, I I think this is one of those situations where the owner is bleeding right now and desperate uh-huh. and the price is just too high. Yeah. The other, the other part here is I'm never a fan of trying to wholesale properties like this. And, uh, you know, the reason why, uh-huh. um, my, my opinion on, on a, on this type of buyer, right? The, the buyer who buys this property is there's a handful of people in my opinion, in the United States that want to purchase a property like this. And so first and foremost, finding them is going to be a a task. Right. Second, when you are positioning yourself in a deal like this, you know, when we're doing single family wholesale, being the principal in the deal is easy because we can get earnest money. We can, you know, you know, I can, I can back you for funds to, to be able to make sure that you've got the, the, the funds to be able to write a, a legitimate offer. And so, these those nuances are easy for us to overcome but when you're talking about a deal like this right you need to have control of this even even if this the numbers on this deal were different i i think that the numbers on this deal aren't going to attract a lot of buyers just because of where interest rates are right now and um the challenge in the commercial real estate office space is it's just starting to become difficult so this is like the first of very many dominoes that you're going to see falling over the next couple of years. But the buyer who wants to buy this deal is not going to want to work with a wholesaler. The buyer who buys this deal is going to want to work directly with the owner of the property. And you're going to need to have some way to control this to stop that conversation from happening. Right. And it's it's just nearly impossible for you to gain control of this because before a seller is even going to let you contract this, they're going to give you the full sniff test. They're going to look at your financials. They're going to make sure that you've got the ca- the capacity to do this deal. And you're going to be stuck in a situation where you've got a seller who's going to say, this person doesn't have the ability to do this deal. And you're going to have a buyer who's going to say, even if you brought this opportunity, even, let's just say you were lucky and got this under contract. Your buyer is going to say, there's no way this guy's going to be able to perform on this. Uh There's no way. So I would way rather just wait for his contract to cancel. And I'm going to go directly to that seller and and ink out a good deal for myself. Because even at 13 million right now, you don't even have a profit in there. Right. Right. So so this is just one of those situations that I would normally uh, advise the community stay away from. Because you're going to spend a lot of time jumping down a rabbit hole here trying to figure out, you know, how do how do we make sense of this when really the the 
you're looking for a needle in the haystack and that needle, the, the needle in the hay, for this kind of deal, they're, they're out there right now, but they're not ready to buy right now. They're waiting. They're waiting another 12, 18 months before they start really poking around looking for a deal. Gotcha. Hey, Ben, do, do you know how much debt is on the property in, in whether that, no, and then what the term is in whether it's assumable? So um, you bring that up. The I did get one offer from a buyer and it was a creative finance offer. And it was, I believe it was $5 million down, maybe $35,000 a month for two years, and then a $6 million balloon at two years. And the seller was game for that. Hmm. So no, I do not know the note or how much is left on it, but I do know the seller is open to creative finance. And uh, so that's that's all I know about that. So I would dig, because that could really jeopardize your deal, right? Because if, if that, that, that seller has like a two-year balloon coming up or something like that, or whether they won't let that be assumed, you know, and so that, that, that piece, you know, it, I mean, good job on getting an offer on that, that building. Yeah. And now it's about trying to verify it before, because the hardest part was probably getting a buyer to the table for this specific deal in today's market. Now you want to make sure that the structure set up so there's not weird hiccups going through that deal. And so I would really dig into, you know, I would talk to the seller and say, hey, look, we have a serious buyer here. You're okay with the terms. Now we got to dig a little deeper on this. Uh, dig into what that loan is because that can kill the deal right there. Um, uh-huh. Who's the bank, whether it's assumable. Um, and then also check what the debt is too because I'm, I'm trying to think if 35 grand a month is going to cover... So are they doing zero interest on, on the deferred rest of the, cause I'm guessing the loans below 50%. So then there's gonna be a little bit of a seller carry back on that too. Did you guys discuss rate and term on that as well? I'm, yeah, I believe so. So that was, like I said, the 5 million down 35,000 a month fixed. And then I think it was either two or 4% interest on the $6 million balloon payment in two years. Would that would be in addition to the thirty five thousand dollars a month? I I'm not sure. So I think okay, yeah, I I think the two percent interest or four percent interest was just on the balloon payment. And, and maybe it's just owned outright. If the guy, if the seller's entertaining that, I think they might own that. Which you know, honestly, those properties a lot of times are. Like I said, they're kind of rich guy properties. It's like they just they write a check and they want to buy it for the location because it's really hard to own beachfront and. It's a different game, but I I would really dig into that because that's going to really make or break this deal for you. Um, but but if they're five million down, six million balloons, so the seller will take eleven. Uh-huh. Okay, so they're flexible off that thirteen. Yeah, they're a little flexible. I think I think that's why the offer didn't get accepted. They wanted, I think the counter was thirteen point five million total. So I would think it was the counter was seven million down and then six million balloon or something like that. So they. They wanted full price and they, that's why the deal didn't go through. Cause we got an offer. I was like, you guys need to take this offer because nobody's obviously interested in this space right now. How are you being compensated at that with the creative offer? Just out of curiosity, by the way, can, like that is phenomenal that you were able to put, put together somebody to come to the table with $5 million cash to take this Yeah, incredible job. Yeah. So how we would have gotten compensated was we our assignment fee would have came out of the down payment. Smart. So one of the guys I was working with, he tacked on $250,000 onto his down payment. And that would have been our assignment fee split three ways. So we would have made a lot of money if that did go through, but we're still in the negotiation process. I haven't talked to the buyer in a week or so. So we're you know, still trying to hammer out the terms and figure it out. Did, did you have your buyer sign a confidential notice too? That way you protect your deal a little bit? An NDA, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. But James, do, do those really do anything? <laughs> no, but you know, if you're working with the right buyers, people have integrity. It's, you know, if, yeah. I would say if if you can't trust that buyer, to if they're going to sign that agreement and walk on you anyways, your deal's not going to happen in regardless. And so, um, you know, I think it's just, it's a good practice. At the end of the day, you can't prevent scumbags. <laughs> True. But I would definitely do that if you, because if, that's a, that's a property you almost have to reverse shop. Right. Where you're like, okay, I got the opportunity. Let me go out and find, find that buyer for it. And so you just want to protect yourself and have good, honest conversations. But I would dig deeper into those terms. So is if you get that buyer on that hook, you want to be able to lock them in and, and the, 
And so get every piece of term, every piece of debt that's owed, especially if there's a carry back, which you're probably going to need for this right now, because on, on vacant office space, the commercial loans are, they don't have a whole lot of appetite right now. And so that debt's going to be very, very essential to this deal regardless. Okay. So I guess my question is, is cap rate like the most important thing or is there more to it? Because I know pro forma is important because you're, you're projecting what it's going to make, but what, what? make what's going to make this deal appealable to not just this buyer but more buyers cheaper <laughs> i mean it, it, what, one thing would be to find out what potential use can it has and that would require going to the city planners and and understanding because maybe that's what your buyer is thinking is office is not doing great right now but if it has another possible use and it's beachfront that there that could be interesting yeah definitely so you're thinking like a mixed use uh, situation, Kathy, where maybe you've got some retail or office in the bottom and some uh, residential, maybe in the in the in the middle units. Yeah, po possibly it would it would just require speaking to planning, right? But uh, those beachfront, I see there's a lot of development in that area, and I imagine that that there is value there. It's just currently not 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 office, right? And I would imagine too that there's going to be some pushback but likely from the residents of the area to increase density for uh, residential units there which could be you know again if that's if that you're throwing that variable in, into there um to for its desirability then you need an, a much more extended timeline to get a deal like that done because that would be a contingent situation to find out if that mixed use play could be there i would be looking at neighboring uh office complex competition especially if they're full and figuring out what are they doing or what are they offering that is uh, causing their building to be full. What are the tenants that are in that space? Because then you can market it to your buyers as bringing in the same types of tenants because you know it's proven to work in that area. Okay. Ben, just for context, I uh, I looked it up for you. The, the average cap rate for prime office in West Palm Beach is 5.8%. So it's a significant way off what the rest of the offices are trading for, and this could be a great property. I, I don't, I don't know, and I don't buy offices, but um, that cap rate on a half leased place and trusting Performa, and you need to do a lease up in a very different, a difficult office leasing environment right now um, is pretty risky. You're you're basically buying at an, ex you know, assuming the best possible conditions, and and that's not reality right now. I mean, even if your buyer wanted to take on the risk, finding a bank that will take on the risk is, I think, the more difficult challenge. This is kind of an uh, end user, user operator building. You know, it's, I mean, one thing you could do is you could reach out to commercial real estate brokers and say, do are any of your clients that, you know, with their bigger clients that, that are well funded, is their leases expiring? Do they want to move their building into prime? Because that's an A plus property. Yeah, And, you know, like a big attorney firm or something like that, maybe they want to move there because it's more of a presence thing. But I don't think investors really are going to be all over this. It's going to be a user, a user operator. That's a great idea. You know, that's I would I would really tap into it. But at the end of the day, wholesaling, when you, when you have something very niche like this and complex, they're hard to dispo. And there's a lot of wasted time and effort that goes into that. Uh -huh. And sometimes it's easy. I remember back, especially when I was a brand new wholesaler, it was like, I got this cool piece of property. But it just wasn't a buy. But I was so distracted by the shininess of how cool it was, I just ended up wasting a lot of time. And so, you know, going after the masses works really well with wholesaling. James, I was just gonna say the same thing that you know, stay in your lane. The mistakes that all of us have made are when we did something we didn't understand, and it was shiny and beautiful and beachfront and all these things. But if you don't understand office and you don't know how to underwrite it, don't do it. Or, or at least have somebody on your team who does know how to do that. Yeah, definitely. What do, what do I say all the time, right? Play in traffic so you can get hit. I like that. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> there, there, I'm stealing that, Jamil. There's not a lot of traffic here, my man. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, I think this was very useful, though, because I um, not this is not the only commercial building I'm working on. Well, I'm working on big apartment complexes. I think there's a 192 unit portfolio deal in San Antonio I'm working in right now. So this is definitely helpful. And I think hopefully I can do better underwriting the next one and 
get that out to buyers. And- well, you didn't do a bad job at all, Ben. I mean, the fact that you brought a creative buyer, the fact that you brought a creative buyer to the table at all, I, I would say that you've probably done more for this seller uh, or brought more action to this seller than they've had since they put this property or, or started thinking about putting this property on the market to sell. So yeah. uh, don't, don't discredit yourself, bro. You did something phenomenal, even bringing a, a potential player to the table. So that was incredible. Right. But I really wanted to touch your, your question real fast. Does cap rate, is that the end all and be, be all in commercial? Absolutely not. When you're talking about what the type of property that you're looking at, this is a high appreciation, high demand area. The one of the plays in a, a, a deal like this is going to be what Kathy said first and foremost: is there a higher and better use for the property? And then next is the land value. You got two acres of prime beachfront in West Palm Beach. This land itself is is highly desirable and appreciates with consider with you know at considerable levels. And so, you know, there's a reason why Kathy lives on a a, a spread in Malibu, looking overlooking the ocean. Right. She understands. She understands the value of property like that. So in, in a deal like this, Ben, it's not just cap rate. You are definitely getting value for the two acres of prime beachfront. Definitely. All right. Well, Ben, thank you so much for sharing this deal and your experiences with us. It's uh, It sounds like you've, you've made a great career for yourself already. And uh, we appreciate you sharing this with us. Hopefully you learned something. Yeah, I definitely did. And I appreciate the help and having me on, guys. And congratulations on all your success so so early and yeah. being able to go after your dreams. It's so inspiring. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Pat. See you, brother. All right. We're going to move on to our next deal. And joining us now is Heidi De La Torre. Heidi, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Thank you for having me. Great. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I used to be a nurse for 23 years and had a great profession. And then in 2019, I was no longer a nurse. And when people get bored, they get into trouble. And so alcohol became my trouble. And uh, May 2021, I got sober. And again, with boredom, as a recovering alcoholic, uh, boredom could be the worst thing. So then I started consuming content. I had no idea what escrow was. I had never done a real estate deal. I have never owned my own house or anything like that. So I learned a lot. And as of the end of 2022, my husband had left his full-time job to join me wholesaling full-time. We um, bought an RV. We did almost $100,000 in assignment fees from May until the end of December. And now we live in our RV with the goal of traveling the country as digital nomads, even though we are over the age of 50. Anyone can be a digital nomad, first exactly. of all, and congratulations. <laughs> well, congratulations on your success and your recovery. That's a, it's an inspiring and great story, and I'm glad to hear that real estate has helped you in, in your life, and it sounds like in more than one way. We'd love to hear about the deal that you're working on now. So this deal is in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and it is. Um, it actually came into our radar at the end of January, and we see that there could be potential there, but this thing as of today, I checked it, has been on the market for 265 days. And it is a quadruplex with a separate unit, so basically five rental possibilities. It is listed on the MLS as like land opportunity. And it was through our deep diving that we found out that there was a structure on it, talked to the agent, and then found out that, yes, it actually is a structure. So the structure itself, um, but with all of the structures, is 2,044 square feet. It is a 1953 build on a 9,200 square foot lot. It is zoned RD15, which is unconventional. And it is about 100 yards from the beach. So it's not beachfront, but it's very close to beachfront. The price on it is $1,699,000. As I said, as of today, 265 days on market. The current owner, she purchased it in October of 2019 at $695,000. She owes approximately $485,000 on her mortgage. 
There is a $364 lien for utility services that was put onto the property November of last year. According to Broward County Assessors, they have it valuated at $1,100,000. We did reach out to the um, Fort Lauderdale Zoning Department. To redevelop the property, it would require permits and bring it to building or bring the building to modern standards, either through modifying or tearing down and rebuilding. They also said that um, a structure on that property cannot be taller than 35 feet and land use codes do not allow more than five dwelling units. What is allowed is a single family rental or single family property or duplex. And if you do either of those, it does not have to go to the planning and developing depart development department, or you can do cluster buildings and that would have to go through planning and developing. We did find out we, the agent has not been providing us the information that we asked for as to the, the rent amounts. We do know that a couple are long-term rentals, a couple are used for vacation rentals, but the, he is not, the owner is difficult and has not provided us with the P&L statements. But we do know that long-term rental, currently she rents at $2,300 per unit. So vacation rentals, um, she has been renting out at $3,200 a month per unit. And so right now she's currently using two for long-term, two for vacation, and then the separate dwelling she is actually using for her own residence. So she lives on site. That totals currently at $11,000 per month. With the possibilities, um, well, currently it's, that would average, that would be $132,000 a year. And with a projected of 52,800 in expenses, the NOI would be 79,200, which at that price point, the cap rate I've figured out is 4.6%. There is growth opportunity. I did see the average rent for long-term rentals over there would be about 2,600 to $3,000 a month. I based it on the lower 2,600. Vacation rentals can be a minimum of $4,000 per month if you were to do like Airbnb type stuff and, you know, go on daily rates. So the possibility at the lowest point would be annual revenue of $158,400, expenses $63,360, NOI of $95,040, the cap rate going up to 5.5%, but with the existing structure, I could see that could be slightly higher without having the information that we needed, that we do need, um, it's hard to tell all of that. We did look at it for the land value and in April of last year, a 6,000 square foot lot within a mile radius sold for $3,100,000. What was the size of that, Heidi? 6,000 square foot lot. And, you're, and the size of your lot? 9,200. I like the sound of that. S similar location or was that oceanfront? It's basically that lot was the same distance from the beach that this is. It's a little bit further south of the subject property. Do you have the same zoning? Um, I did not research that. I did not see if it, if it did. Okay. Well, that may be your buyer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I also found a single family that sold in July of last year for 2,240,000. It's similar build because with, with this multifamily, it can be converted back, like it can be converted to a single family with an ADU from a fourplex. The city would allow that. Um, we were told by the agent that with that property, the way it is and the size of it, that the building could be torn down and about three townhouses could probably be put onto it and sold between two and three million dollars each. But I don't. I was not able to find comps that support new builds. There's not very many new builds in that neighborhood. So basically bringing this property to, to you guys as a panel for coaching is that we've not been sure how to approach this and exactly every single thing that we need to look for and what type of investor we should target for this property. For me, I'd look at a couple of things, right? So uh, essentially, it's a five plex. So you can look at people interested in small multifamily. 
So you can pull buyers of small multifamily in the area um, and see who has purchased small multifamily uh, under 10 units within a five to 10 mile radius because maybe they like that area. Um, the other thing I would need to know is like, what's the, what, what amount of renovation is going to have to go into this? Like if I want to keep it a five unit, what's it going to cost me? And then do the math on what's it going to cost me if I need to convert it to a single with an ADU, right? Because then you have those numbers for your buyer. Um, because if you, if you buy it at one seven and based on the rent you were saying, you could probably hit 1%. You could probably get to you know, 17000 a month um, if you have the right rents, but it's, I'd assume that's going to take a renovation to get there, and so then you're not at 1% anymore. You're not cash flowing. Um, so I would need to know what's the, what's the size of that renovation, but I would try to find people who bought multifamily in a 5 to 10 mile radius and call them and see if they're interested in that. And then, But the, the land play seems like a really good idea. That's a big sale um, for just land that you have a comp for close by. And so the next thing I would probably do is find out who bought that and see if they want to buy more or look, you know, look five to 10 miles out and see if there's any new development going on and find those builders and see if they're looking to expand. Um, cause you could have a land play there, but you've got to find the right developer. Yeah. And be careful though, cause it's listed on market. And it's active. Yeah. And builders, I will say builders will just go buy it. Um, and they probably have already looked at it. Um, you know, it, what, what I like to do a lot of times on dirt plays, it, and it sounds like if the, if the broker's advertising it as dirt, um, he, I, I'm, I'm banking, I, I would guess the condition's a little beat up to where it might not be that rehabable at the end of the day. And so that's probably going to get you to the same strike price regardless. If it's a beat up five plaques, you're going to have a heavy value add. So you're going to need to drive the price down. But a lot of ways that you can do that or what we do is we're going to dig in and you can find a dirt comp somewhere. You're going to be able to find a townhome, go that whole block, go all the way up. Um, you know, maybe don't look on the MLS, use apps that you can go through line by line on those and, and find what that sale was get the value and then target 25 to 30 percent of the total build out value so if you have two townhomes that are selling for two and a half each that's five million bucks you want to be at a strike price at 25 percent of that um and then make sure that you get at least a two-week feasibility on your contract because then you the, the thing about wholesaling dirt is you got to grab it secure it market it get the buyer on board, and then they have to run their fees, right? So you're burning up part of the fees to get your buyer on, but then you got to get, you still got to give your builder the, the time to run the feasibility. But typically right now with dirt, at least in our Pacific Northwest, I think this is very common across. The demand has fallen. That's probably why this is sitting here. And, you know, you want to be around 25% of build out. That's usually a good, safe rule of thumb, um, especially for like a transitionary market. Builders were paying up to 35 to 40%. Uh, before the kind of interest rates soared. Right. And I do know, I mean, just the fact that it's been on market as long as it has, there's something about the property that it's it's overpriced. Yeah. And Hattie, I want to ask you about that. Can you tell me or speak to the pricing history on this? It, 265 days is a tremendous amount of time. Has there been any price reductions? Are we seeing that, do we have any signs of motivation on the seller? It was listed. Looks like she's gone through quite a bit. She listed it last year in January for two point one million. It went contingent in February. It went back on market February eleventh at two point one million. It went contingent again March of last year. Then it fell out of contract again. So in April she increased the price to 2.4 million and then she removed the listing in May. Then she relisted it in July at 2.299 million, so 2.3 million. August did a price reduction to 2 million. The end of August went down to 1.899 million and then removed the listing. Right now I don't see at what point this one became active. But I have a feeling that because my since I'm not licensed, my resources are limited. But um, 
it's showing that it's been listed 265 days. Yeah, last year in May, my husband saying it went under contract for $1.7 million. This pricing makes no sense. This is a very, in my opinion, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, this is an irrational seller. They don't know what they want. They want yeah. this, they want this, they want this, they want the world, then they want to cut. In my opinion, my thing, you get your number, you throw it at them, you move on to next person. Because that person is just not, they have no logic behind their pricing. Also, I think, James, not a lot of motivation there, right? Because you, you, when you see, yeah. when somebody comes, goes from 1.7 to 2.4, <laughs> That's like an anger. That's like an anger listing. You know, like I'm gonna show them. I'm gonna I'm gonna put it on for two point four million dollars now and see how they like that. Like, what are you doing? You know, or just bad advice from their from their agent if they had it listed, where the agent's like, oh, maybe I've heard that before from agents. We just have to raise the price. It'll make it sound more valuable. But I, I could tell you at least from my experience with beachfront areas, a lot of times where I live. People have their homes on the market all the time because they just want to see if some rich person comes into town and feels like buying beachfront property and they just list it really high to see if if someone will take it. Right. Yeah. And from what we found with uh, looking her up with the city and everything, she has had multiple code violations, 24 violations. It sounds like she's just a very... Um, I don't even know the word, just rebellious kind of a person that's like, you know what, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So I agree. I think that she probably is just one of those that is like, I'll see what happens and she can afford to leave it sitting. That was my original thought, which is why we didn't look at it. And then when Jamil had said, you know, the panel, I thought, you know, let's just get an opinion on it as to what we could do with it and where our offer would be because honestly my offer with the pricing history and what we know and if it's going to be a teardown is exactly the land value which is way below what she wants i i personally the way i would look at this is i i think you've probably got something worth around a million bucks yeah because we were i was thinking like high 900s yep and and you know that's the that's the fair market value for this uh and you know, even going from a five unit to a single family, just imagine how janky that that structure would be, right? If you were going to convert what's already there, a five unit to a single family, I mean, that's not going to work. That's not going to look natural or good for that type of, for, you know, for that kind of area. So that that's not the play, right? The the play on this is is continuing to run it as short term rentals, and and to try to maximize the nightly rate by renovating and adding value but the property because they're advertising as land value is probably not in that kind of condition so you'd probably got a half a million dollar or more remodel on this to get to squeeze out to get this to like a one percent i think you need to buy this at like a million put five to six hundred thousand dollars into it now you're in it for around after all your costs around 1.7 and then you cash flow 17,000 gross a month. That's it. That's the deal. That's it. But I would also look into the insurance costs because they have gone up tremendously in any of those beachfront properties in Florida that could kill all that cash flow. Here comes Kathy with the gale force winds. Sorry, <laughs> it's true. It's it's I mean, yes, gale force is is a is a term now in Florida. We we've just seen it personally where we're not even near the ocean, but uh, insurance costs have gone up so much, along with property tax. Awesome. Especially after the last one that wiped out the insurance company. So they're they're vengeful right now. Kind of like our seller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of that, it's like with these irrational sellers, just put the number on it and just stay where it is. Hey, this is where I'm at. And you can always check in with them, but just leave it. You like I would just put your number on it, give it to them, because you never know. We have had people ask for like two million, and we bought it for seven hundred later. It was just, um, you know, because wholesaling and off market, and Jamil knows this. It's like it's just that consistency of going, nope, this is where I'm at. Move on to the next deal, but number still here, and and just kind of leave it with that broker, and then you never know. Oh, and c congrats on 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 the no drinking. I'm twenty years no drinking. That's awesome. Oh, nice. You don't even look old enough to have 20 years sobriety. <laughs> like, did you come out of the womb drunk? <laughs> I, I got after I got after young. Ask him about when he used to be DJ 100 proof. That's <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> that was, that was so good, nice. Dave. Well, thank you. Congratulations to you. It changed everything for me. So congratulations.
Yeah, and it does. It's a, it's just amazing the life that I'm living right now versus where I was. So yeah, and I'm so grateful and appreciative of everybody and everything. Beautiful, Heidi, you're amazing. We love you, mm-hmm. and just yeah. congrats on all of it. You're, you're such a rock star. Great job. Thank you. All right, thank you for for joining us. And if you if you either of you, Ben or Heidi, have an update on these properties in the future, either pass them along to Jamil or let Kaylin know, and we'd love to hear about them. Um, it's always exciting for us to keep track of what you all are up to. Definitely. All right. Well, take care. Thanks again. All right. That was super fun. It was great to have Heidi and Ben on the show. What did you all think of the show? Did you know, do you like doing these types of shows where we have people bring their live deals on? Kathy, what do you think? I love it. I love it because I learned so much from everyone here. You guys are brilliant. It's so true. I like hearing everyone else's questions. It's it's fun, funny and interesting to hear sort of like the order of operations people ask in. And, you know, I've never wholesaled. So I, I really enjoyed this. I learned a lot from, from everyone. It was interesting to me, the the just the, the level uh, that, you know, they're, they haven't limited themselves on the kinds of deals that they'll do, right? So I just love the fact that people can explore all these different ways to really get involved in, in the deal. And it, to me, that was really interesting and fun. This is like my morning meditation. It's like you, when you get in, it, I love these shows because it's just like you get to look at deals, like calm down, you get excited. But I mean, it, it, both, both people were awesome. The fact that they're, they're like Jamil said, going after some big, big stuff um it is pretty respectful because you know i know when i started it was more like just trying to find that ninety thousand dollar house yeah i think it's cool because a i love looking at deals but i'm also just like i just i'm such a student of real estate um that i enjoy seeing what other people do in the space and how they approach their problems uh because at the end of the day all of us that's what we do we're problem solvers and uh you know i stay pretty close to my own lane here in my local state and the types of deals that i do so getting to explore other people's deals and see how they're handling or managing the risks that they're taking on. It's, it's always a great time. Awesome. Great. Well, we'd love to hear from all of our listeners. If you like this kind of show, we've done two of them. Now we did one a couple of weeks ago, residential. Uh, now we've done some commercial ones and we'd love to hear if this is a format that you like and would want us to continue. If you have any feedback for us, you can always hit me up on Instagram or I'm at the data deli. You can find us on the bigger pockets. Uh, on the forums there, or we would always appreciate a good review on Apple or Spotify. Um, and you can also find all four of these lovely people on Instagram. I'll just let you all shout those out. Kathy, go ahead. Kathy Fetke on Instagram. And Jamil. At JDamji, at J-D-A-M-J-I. Henry. At the Henry Washington. And James. It is uh, J Dane. Flips. J-D-A-I-N Flips. I just had an idea. I'm buying DJ 100 Proof. I'm getting that Instagram <laughs> handle right now. I might make the switch. If, I will try to find you guys a photo. <laughs> Please! <laughs> well, for now, I'm still at the Data Deli, but as of tomorrow, I might be DJ 100 Proof. We'll just see. <laughs> Thank you all again for listening. We'll see you next time for On the Market. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Research by Pooja Jindal. And a big thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show on the market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies. <laughs>